It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My uh, question uh, to the Premier. Uh, Premier, we met in your office uh, several weeks ago. It was very kind of you to invite me to uh, meet with you. Um, you. You put a list of bills on the table. You said if we could agree upon these bills that both parties support, we could basically clear the decks so we could get to work on jobs and the economy. Uh, I agree to that, and the programming motion now well underway. So I guess I'm a bit frustrated here because we did our share of the deal. We're moving forward with the bills because we opened up the, now the decks for jobs legislation. But the only thing we see for you so far is an online plea for ideas on jobs and the economy. So I guess I'll ask you directly, Premier, why are you shying away from your end of the deal? Effectively, why are you reneging on your commitment to act on jobs in the economy? Question, thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I appreciate the uh, question from the, the Leader of the Opposition, and I hope that this question signals that he will be supporting our initiatives, such as the Initiative to Support Small Businesses Act that will help 60,000 small businesses, Mr. Speaker, by helping them with their payroll taxes, Mr. Speaker. I hope that it signals that the, uh, that the Leader of the Opposition will support our social enterprise uh, initiative Mr. Speaker, which should create 1,600 new jobs. I hope that it means that the Leader of the Opposition will support our investments when we make investments like the $70.9 million in Ford, Mr. Speaker, that will protect 2,800 jobs and create a platform that will allow Ford to be able to compete globally, Mr. Speaker, and increase their capacity. So I hope, Mr. Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition's question signals that he will be supporting those in initiatives, Answer. including the initiative yesterday that I, uh, that I worked with the Toronto Region Board of Trade, Mr. Speaker, to increase the agri-food sector. I hope he's going to be supporting us, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. You know, it's, it's unfortunate, as I said, uh, Speaker, that the only ideas uh, the Premier's put on the table are uh, warmed over NDP ideas that came through the 1 800 Horvath line last time around. She's now launched her own um, website consultation. We need a plan. Uh, you know, one thing I always enjoy with my, my grandparents in, in beautiful Sarnia, Ontario, was playing euchre with my grandparents. A lot of fun. I learned reneging was against the rules. That was just a game. <laughs> reneging in a real life deal has real world consequences. This means young people are not being put to work, it means companies are passing over Ontario. Premier, it's time to get on with the job of creating jobs in the province of Ontario. If you're out of ideas, why don't you take some of ours and put people into good jobs in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Again, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and, and Employment is going to want to speak to some of the specifics, Mr. Speaker. But I want to just, I want to just uh, react to what the uh, the uh, leader of the uh, opposition talked about, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the the uh, Conservative Party, when we put forward a proposal that a couple of uh, bills that are job creating, the Supporting Small Businesses Act and the Waste Diversion Act, both of which that will directly create jobs, Mr. Speaker, we suggested that those be put in the programming motion, and they said no, Mr. Speaker. They said they didn't want to have anything to do with two bills that are direct job creators, Mr. Speaker. You know, and the, the leader of the opposition has uh, has thrown into his questions in the last couple of days the notion that somehow as we create jobs, because the work that we're doing on those pieces of legislation and yes, the investments sir. that we're making is crea are creating jobs, that somehow it's not okay to be asking the people of Ontario to engage with us and talk to us about what other ideas they might have. I reject that notion categorically, Mr. Speaker. I think it's our responsibility to talk to the people of Ontario. Um, but, but, Premier, your idea is to increase red tape, increase tax, increase spending. That's what drove us into the ditch in the first place. So, of course, we're going to say no to those ideas, but I hope you'll say yes to some of ours. And what I'm perplexed with is why you're reneging on your side of the deal. I don't understand what the paralysis is. I don't understand what the deadlock is. Uh, why are you moving forward with a jobs plan? We, we put our plan on the table. In fact, I invite you to steal any of our ideas. For example, to stop the Green Energy Act and the imposition of wind turbines that are dividing communities and driving up hydro rates. To change Order. the way apprenticeship works in this province and put young people into good jobs like Garfield Dunlop has recommended. There are so many ideas. Why don't we actually move forward on one together to put people back to work? Why are you reneging on the deal that we made? Thank you. Premier? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I appreciate
appreciate that the Leader of the Opposition met with me. I appreciate that we had a conversation about some bills where we might have agreement and we could move forward. But what I did not commit to, Mr. Speaker, was slashing jobs. I did not commit to cutting programs and stopping the progress that we've made on renewable energy, on education, on health care. I never committed to that, Mr. Speaker, because that is the plan that the Leader of the Opposition is putting forward, Mr. Speaker. And I never, I never would agree to such a plan, Mr. Speaker, because what we believe is that investing in people and in investing in infrastructure and supporting a business climate that allows businesses to expand, that that's how we that's get the economy yeah. cooking, Mr. That's Speaker. Right. And that's working, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Jobs are being created in the province. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, recently we learned that top paid Pan Am executives have run amok with expense claims in bad faith, claims without receipts, and incomplete claims. You indicated this was unacceptable and that rules needed to be strengthened. Premier, that's rich. You knew these were the rules. You made these rules. You stood by while the rules were abused for years. Don't just be disappointed and have a conversation with these people. Get the money back, Premier. Premier, tell me when a review of all 2020-2015 expense claims will commence, and when will the executives be ordered to repay all their bad faith claims back? Mr. Speaker, I said yesterday that it was uh, unacceptable, some of the expenses that had been reported. The minister responsible for the Pan Am Parapan Games, Mr. Speaker, has already directed the board, had already directed the board to tighten the rules, Mr. Absolutely. Speaker. So I've said it wasn't acceptable. I've said that it needed to change. The member from Renfrew will not use the moment while I'm getting quiet. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, as I said, this happened before these reports came out. The minister had already spoken to the uh, had already spoken to the board, and the rules are being changed, Mr. Speaker. And as I said yesterday, if there were breaches of the rules and if there is reimbursement uh, that needs to happen, Answer. then we will ask for that to uh, happen, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Over there. Speaker, clearly there's no evidence that the minister ever did have a conversation with anyone uh, about expenses there. Uh, it, Speaker, if you follow the pennies, you'll find the dollars. The bad faith expense claims are indicative of a much greater endemic problem at the upper levels and the upper echelon of the Pan Am organizational structure. Entitlement. Indeed, the there, there are tens of thousands of dollars that have been burned partying on lavish uh, hospitality suites and jaunts in Mexico and Guadalajara, London. And when I FOI'd the minister for all expenses on these trips, including travel, we received an incomplete response only with flight itineraries, an act of bad faith, Premier. Where's to be clear, this isn't about Starbucks or dog travel or parking. This is nickel and diming, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. Question. That's why, Premier, you must intervene. When will you set an example from the top in order and order repayment of all bad faith expenses and expenses outside of the rules? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Tourism and uh, Culture and Sport is going to want to speak to this, but I want to just say, as I said yesterday, the the report are, uh, of these kinds of decisions and these kinds of expenses are unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. The minister has already acted, had acted before these reports came out, that the rules had to be tightened, that they had to be changed, and that is happening, Mr. Speaker. But what I did say yesterday is that I make a distinction between these kinds of abuses of, uh, of the rules, Mr. Speaker, and the fact that in order to land these games, there did need to be travel, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there did need to be trips to Guadalajara in order to get these games, because we know that these games are going to be a great yes, opportunity for Ontario, for Ontario athletes, for uh, job creation, 26,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, and we want to make them the best that they can be. Final supplementary. Yes, Speaker, clearly everyone's scrambling today for the best ex excuse for this binge spending by Pan Am executives. Uh, just today, uh, Premier, your own minister 
practically abdicated responsibility for the games and estimates. Shame. Shame. The TO 2015 executives themselves will tell you the government knew and approved the guidelines for expenses. The Pan Am minister will tell you that the executives followed policy, but not common sense. The Premier will tell you that we need to tighten the rules. Premier, a day late and a dollar short. We held all dollar over short. again. Everyone is so busy backpedaling, they've actually lost sight of who they serve. The hardworking families of Ontario whose money has been exploited. Enough is enough, Mr. Premier. Mr. Premier, Affairs when will you order repayment Question. of all bad faith expenses? When will it happen? Or go over again. Order. Uh, yes, I agree with you. Enough is enough, the member from Leeds Granville. You set it up, I knock it down. Premier. Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker, for the, for the question. And uh, the opposition honourable member, uh, this morning we had a uh, we started member from Renfrew knows better. It's a five-hour estimate, and uh, we engaged a very uh, fruitful uh, conversation uh, in the one and a half first, uh, hour on that. So uh, this is good. Uh, we will be answering more questions from the from the critic over there, and I wish he also listened to our explanation and and uh, other than just uh, keep asking questions without really listening to the answer or refuse uh, to, uh, for those answers. Uh, in in terms of the uh, reimbursement, I think uh, we answered this question already. Uh, answer. That, that under the broader public sector expenses directive, TO 2015 must establish rules for all individuals in the organization with respect to Thank you. bill Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. When I, when I stand, you sit. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After dodging our questions for days, the Premier admitted yesterday that her staff met with Liberal lobbyists hired by Alice Dawn to pass legislation on behalf of their company. So can the Premier tell us when those meetings actually occurred and who attended on her behalf? Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I, <laughs> I don't know exactly when the meetings took place, and what I said yesterday was that uh, we meet with a range of people from across all sectors, as I assume does the uh, leader of the third party, Mr. Speaker. So I cannot, I cannot give the uh, leader of the third party the time and date. And Mr. Speaker, in fact, I never denied that those meetings took place, and I, uh, I recognize that uh, if the leader of the third party wants times and dates, I can uh, undertake to get those for her. Please stop the clock, please. I, uh, I'm going to nip this in the bud. The member uh, from Glengarry, uh, Prescott Russell, the Minister of Rural Affairs and the Minister of the Environment will cease holding up any kind of prop, and it stops now. Supplementary question. I believe uh, we would like those dates, Speaker, and so would the people of Ontario. Uh, yesterday, the Minister of Labour told reporters that he had told Alice Don lobbyists that he didn't have anything to state, say to them because it would be inappropriate to discuss a matter that was before the courts. Why did the Premier's team agree to such a meeting, Speaker? The Minister. Thank you, Premier. Again, Mr. Speaker, I will just say that uh, in government, in opposition, uh, there are many people in the province who want to speak to us about issues of concern to them. And so, Mr. Speaker, there are meetings that happen every single day in this place and in our offices where people with concerns come to us, they raise issues, Mr. Speaker, and they propose solutions and they propose paths forward. And some of those paths forward are adopted and others are not, Mr. Speaker. Sometimes a private member's bill is developed in, as a result of some of those meetings, Mr. Speaker. And Sometimes there is nothing that happens as a result of those meetings, Mr. Speaker, but the responsibility of politicians is to meet with people, to hear their concerns, and to determine if there's a way that we can facilitate a response or whether uh, there's nothing actually that we can do. And I hope that the leader of the third party understands that that's all of our responsibility, Mr. Speaker.
Leader of the third party, final Speaker, supplementary. On September 9th, the Premier told reporters that she supported Bill 74, and she seemed very well briefed with, briefed with Ellis Don's talking points on that bill. She said, and I quote, this is an anomalous situation. The situation arose in the 1950s. From my perspective, it's about a level, level playing field, unquote. Now, if the Minister of Labour thought it was inappropriate to comment on an issue before the courts, why was the Premier commenting on it, wow. Speaker? Premier. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I was outlining my understanding of what the issue was. I was not taking a position in terms of the court case. I was outlining my understanding of the situation, Mr. Speaker. And so that was and is my understanding, Mr. Speaker. There has now been a court ruling, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we're reviewing. There's a 15-day appeal period, Mr. Speaker, and at the at the uh, as that process unfolds, we will see where the uh, where the legislation goes. But Mr. Speaker, I have had n at no time uh, put myself in a position where I was interfering with a court case, exactly. Mr. Speaker. I was outlining you know my understanding of the situation, oh, and I think the leader of the third party knows full well that that was the situation. Answer, thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Also for the Premier, Speaker. It seems that the Premier and her office were all too eager to sit down with Liberal insiders working for Ellis Don, even though the Minister of Labour thought that it would be completely inappropriate. So can the Premier tell us whether whether she or anyone on her team made a commitment to pass a bill as long as it was introduced by another political party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I spoke to this issue yesterday, and the uh, leader of the third party is seeing conspiracy where there is none, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, because there was no such arrangement. This was a private member's bill that was put up by the opposition, Mr. Speaker. Members debated the bill in the House from all parties. And we comment on legislation, Mr. Speaker. We comment on the substance of legislation. That's what we've commented on. That's how the situation arose, Mr. Speaker. Now the divisional court has made a decision. There is a 15-day uh, period in which there could be an appeal, and we are reviewing the decision of the divisional court, Mr. Speaker. Two supplementary. Mr. Speaker, a conspiracy between the Liberals and the Conservatives to ram through legislation for one company. Who'd have thought it? People have serious, serious questions about this government's priorities, Speaker. The government keeps blindly pa pressing on, trying to, uh, trying to ram this bill through the legislature on behalf of one single company, well-connected company at that, Speaker, even while the arguments for doing so fall apart before their eyes. Ontario families, Ontario families, Speaker, are looking for life to get more affordable for them. They're looking for jobs for the young people in those families. They're looking for the health care system to be there for them when they need it. Does the Premier really think that one well-connected donor should come ahead of those families? So, Mr. Speaker, I'm just I'm trying to just get at what this is really about, and I think what we're talking about here is the programming motion. I think that's what the problem is here for the leader of the third party, because, Mr. Speaker, as we have said, the divisional court has made a ruling that uh, we're reviewing. There's a 15-day appeal period, but there seems to be a ruling that is in place now, Mr. Speaker, and so I think that. Really what is at issue here is whether the leader of the third party and her members would be, uh, would be interested and would be supportive of a programming motion that would actually move ahead some pieces of legislation like the Local Food Act, Mr. Speaker, like the act that would protect young kids from, uh, from can uh, tanning beds, Mr. Speaker. Um, if the leader of the third party and her members would support those pieces of legislation as part of the programming motion, Answer. then I think that would be a good thing for the people of Ontario. And she doesn't seem to want to sign on to that and work with us on those pieces of legislation. Final supplementary. Speaker, there are pressing, pressing issues that face the people of this province. They're worried about jobs. They're worried about health care. They're worried about the cost of everyday life, which keeps going up and up and up for them. And instead of delivering for those people, Speaker, the Premier seems determined to deliver for one well-connected company, even while she frantically denies that she's doing so. Is the Premier ready to stop these games and shenanigans, admit this bill is not a priority for the people who are facing tough times in this province, and stop her efforts to ram it through this legislature? Speaker, I believe that the 
2,800 people who work for Ford are very pleased that we made that $70.9 million investment. I believe that the 535 young people who are going to have placements as a result of the Youth Employment Fund, Mr. Speaker, I think they're very pleased with that accomplishment, Mr. Speaker. I think that the 60,000 small businesses that would benefit from the Small Businesses Act that would help with their payroll taxes, I think they're very pleased with that legislation, Mr. Speaker, because that will give them the opportunity to hire more people. I would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the third party would have been supportive of those initiatives and that she would have wanted to work with us, Mr. Speaker, because those are job-creating initiatives, Mr. Speaker, and they are moving forward, and that's our priority on this side of the House. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister. New question, the member from Nepean Carlton. My question is to the Premier. Tomorrow, when your government uh, marks 10 years in office, oh, Ontario oh. taxpayers, you may want to stop and laugh because Ontario ratepayers and taxpayers are going to be lamenting the high and skyrocketing costs of hydro in this province. So when you release later this fall your new long-term energy plan for the province, you're going to have to make up for the enormous amount of credibility that you've lost, particularly with the Green Energy Act and, of course, now with both of these uh, uh, cancelled power plants that the Auditor General will report on uh, later. So the question that I have for you is a simple one, Premier, and it's one I expect a direct response on. Before the new long-term energy plan is tabled, will you assure us in this assembly that you will do a cost calculation of what those canceled gas plants have cost, as well as the Green Energy Act, have cost Ontario taxpayers on their hydro bill per month for the last 10 years? Please. <coughs> you see it, please. Thank you, Premier. Mr. Speaker, you know I remember, and I think everyone here will remember, in 2002, 2003, when we were campaigning, we didn't know when the election was going to be called. It was on again, off again. Um, but I remember how unstable the electricity system was, Mr. Speaker. I remember the brownouts. I remember the blackouts. I remember, Mr. Speaker, that when we came into office. It, Order. Order. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. As will everyone in the House. Uh, Minister, you always find that perfect moment, so I will give you the attention you're asking. The minister responsible for seniors will come to order. Finish, please. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the, the party opposite howls, but Mr. Speaker, we have rebuilt over 80 per cent of our electricity system because it was in the We have a stable supply, Mr. Answer. Speaker. We've jump-started a green energy industry, Mr. Speaker. They'd like to slash that. They'd like to kill those jobs, Mr. Speaker. And I shall give those people that want attention the attention. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Wrap up, please. Please sign. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. I'd like to welcome the Premier to 2013. Yeah. Her government's been in power for a decade, and hydro rates have tripled on their watch because on their long-term energy planning, they've either ignored it completely by saying they're going to build power plants and then cancelling, or coming to this very chamber and promising 50,000 jobs for a green energy plan that has cost Ontario taxpayers and rural communities a lot of money. This government has a lot to answer for, and before they bring forward that next long-term energy plan before the Assembly and before the people of Ontario, I have asked her directly, and I will do it one more time, will she go to the people of this province and tell them exactly how much that Green Energy Act has cost them on their power bill, and will she tell them how much those two cancelled gas plants will cost them on their hydro bill, and will she do it immediately? 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, not, uh, excuse me. As I begin to sit down and people begin to ramp it back up again, both sides are making comments before I even sit down. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. So, um, I think the uh, the member opposite knows full well that the uh, the issues around the cost of the gas plant. We've had a report from the Auditor General in Mississauga. The report on Oakville is coming forward, and we will continue to have that discussion. But, Mr. Speaker, I think that the member opposite should remember that if we talk about going to the people of Ontario and talking about what is uh, what's actually happening, when the PCs capped energy prices in 2002, Mr. Speaker, it caused energy prices to spike. 30 30% in 30 weeks, Mr. Speaker, and that created a $7 billion stranded debt, Mr. Speaker. So when you talk about being honest with the people of Ontario and talking about what costs really are, that's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. While, while someone's giving an answer, if that happens, that's their time. And then when that time is up, you don't get any more time. Your time is up. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, new question. Thank you, Speaker. My question's to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Premier reacted with apparent shock to news about the Pan Am Games' outrageous expenses. But in an interview, Ian Troop, the CEO of Pan Am Games, insisted that the government knew and approved of the guidelines for expenses and salaries. This morning, the minister said that the government did not approve these, but the board did. Speaker, can the premier explain who has the full set of books with every expense listed, who approved these expenses and salaries, and to whom does the Pan Am board actually does or should report? The member from Tourism, Culture, Sport, and uh, responsible for the Pan Am Pan Am. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Uh, uh, TO 2015, the operation side, they report to the board, and the board of Pan Am, they consist of uh, five partners uh, provincial, federal, municipal, and also the sporting, uh, the, sporting uh, the sector, which is the Canadian Olympic uh, Committee, as well as the Paralympic uh, uh, Committee. So, uh, the board approved those expenses, and also the board uh, implement those uh, policies, uh, provide guidance and guidelines for those expenses. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, this, this is sadly not the first time that this government has faced questions of inappropriate spending of taxpayer dollars. Yep. We still remember eHealth and Orange. Yep. This government has allowed the panning games to operate outside the expense rules and accountability that should apply to the expenditure of all Ontario tax dollars. The minister passed the blame to the board today, acting as an independent transfer agent, as though the taxpayers' dollars were not at stake, just like eHealth, Orange, and gas plants. Has this government learned nothing over the last few years? Speaker, can the Premier tell Ontarians why they should trust her government any more than they would trust the McGuinty Liberals with their hard-earned tax dollars? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Let me clarify here. The broader public service expense directive requires designated organizations to establish expense rules where expenses are reimbursed from public funds. These expense rules do not have to be the same as those required by government agencies and ministries within the Ontario Public Service. The province financial oversight of TO 2015 includes administering the transfer payment agreement, review and approval of TO 2015 business plan, reporting from TO 2015, and auditing compliance with provincial directive. Answer. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Economic Trade, Development, Trade, and Employment. Minister, our government has outlined a strong plan for jobs and growth that includes investing in people, infrastructure, and creating the right conditions for businesses to grow and stay in Ontario. 
Speaker, we all know that social entrepreneurship represents a sustainable way to build a diverse and vibrant economy. And this includes people who live in my riding of Scarborough Southwest, who I know will also benefit from the investments our government is making. The government has already, or our, my residents have already seen the work our government is doing for the Ontario network of entrepreneurs, which serves my constituents. Mr. Speaker, through to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Question. Could the minister please update this House on our government's reason strategy, uh, uh, social enterprise announcement? Thank you, Minister of Economic Trade Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member as well from Scarborough Southwest for his question. Mr. Speaker, social enterprises are for-profit and not-for-profit entities that are run like businesses, but have as their overarching goal contributing to the social good and creating a better society. And Ontarians are global leaders when it comes to social enterprise. There are roughly 10,000 social enterprises in the province today, employing more than 150,000 people. Last week, we announced the government announced a three-year, $25 million social enterprise strategy to help build the sector in Ontario. A portion of that funding will be used to create a new $4 million social enterprise demonstration fund to support early-stage social enterprises. And this strategy will benefit, benefit Ontarians by creating thousands of new jobs, Mr. Speaker particularly for youth and other populations that have Answer. traditionally had barriers to employment. Uh, in partnership with the social enterprise sector, our aim is to make Ontario the leading jurisdiction in North America for social enterprise. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his response. And it's great to hear that social entrepreneurs will have the access to the right funding opportunities and support across this province. It is important that people across the province can depend on a sustainable economy, for as you said, Ms. Minister, it's about investing in people, infrastructure, and creating the right business climate for companies to come and grow in Ontario. When I speak to the constituents in my riding, the Sarah government needs to continue to take action and invest in social programs that will help increase employment opportunities across the province. Mr. Speaker, through to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, could the Minister tell the House how pairing economic development and social impact will Stand. create economic and employment opportunities for Ontarians. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, our Social Enterprise Action Plan includes support for the recently announced Social Venture Exchange, or the SVX, which brings together impact investors, investors that also want to seek enterprises that are making a positive difference in society, brings those investors together with social enterprises looking for funding. funding. And we've created an office for social enterprise in my ministry as well to coordinate efforts across government, work with the sector, including promoting partnerships between the private sector, of course, and the not-for-profit sectors. And it's due to the leadership in the sector itself, Mr. Speaker, that great social enterprises like Bullfrog Power, the Brickworks, Goodwill, Turnaround Couriers, and others are thriving and contributing to our communities. Another good example is Rise Asset Management, which is a partnership between CAMH and the Rotman School of Management, where they bring together, they mentor individuals with mental health challenges to become self-sustaining entrepreneurs and business persons. Mr. Speaker, social enterprise is well proven. Uh, we're doing, we have demonstrated our commitment as a province with this $25 million investment. Thank you. Person, the member from Nipissing. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, it took uh, 136 years for Ontario's debt to reach $139 billion, but it took the Liberals only 10 years to double it to $273 billion. Because of your uncontrolled spending, interest is now our third largest expenditure after health and after education, and that's with low interest rates. Because of your uncontrolled spending, you've turned the once mighty Ontario into a have-not province. All other provinces have recovered from the recession and are roaring ahead. But it's clear, Premier, that you have no plan. But we do. Will you work with us to implement our ideas, Premier? Question. Thank you. Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, a couple of things here. One, uh, Ontarians should recognize and be proud of the fact that we are the only jurisdiction in North America to exceed uh, job recovery like no other. 183 percent of jobs have come back to the province since the recession. We are the only government in Canada in over a decade to actually cut spending year over year, Mr. Speaker. 
And as a result, our uh, deficit targets have been reduced by over $5.6 billion. But we always know we need to do better. We will always aspire to do more. That's why we're going to continue investing in people. We're going to continue investing in infrastructure. And we're going to continue to support our businesses to make them even more competitive. And that requires investment. And, and we're prepared to take on that debt for their benefit, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, what we've seen from you so far is a lost decade for Ontario. Our debt has doubled. Our hydro rates have doubled. We have high unemployment. Business is sitting on $500 billion that they will not invest in Ontario. Instead of taking action, you've taken us further down the wrong path of the last 10 years. The solution to Ontario's problems aren't hard to figure out, Premier. They're just not easy to do. Ontario needs a government that has a plan to reduce spending and create jobs, and the courage of their convictions to stick to that plan. Premier, we've put out a plan for discussion. We have 14 white papers, 200 pages. Excuse me. Minister of the Environment will come to order along with the Attorney General, and that's the last time for the Minister of the Environment. Finish Speaker, please. our plan. We have 14 white papers, 200 pages of ideas. Premier, since you have no plan to turn Ontario around, will you please adopt ours? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, as noted, Ontario has exceeded its targets. Our deficit's going down. Our spending has been cut. We're doing all that's necessary to make Ontario. In fact, we are the, the largest jurisdiction in North America, second to none in regards to investment in this province. And the plan that the opposition have put forward is a plan of across-the-board cuts, something that would uh, harm the sensitive recovery that we now have in Ontario. They want to drive down wages through, through harmful right-to-work legislation. They want to fire 10,000 education workers. They want to fire 2,000 help. Stop. Just in case he didn't hear me while he was yelling, I asked the member from Chatham to come to order. So, Mr. Speaker, part of their plan is about firing even more workers, 2,000 health workers, and they want to cancel something that's so critical to the well-being of our future, and that's investing yes, in our children, investing in our youth, investing in our students, and not cancelling 30 percent reduction in tuition. That is about producing skills and making Ontario better. New question? The member from Brandon Lee Gordon Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2010, this government slashed statutory accident benefit payouts by 50 percent across Ontario and 70 percent in the GTA. Yesterday, we finally received official confirmation that the insurance industry has pocketed every single penny of these savings, passing none of them on to Ontario drivers. In stunning testimony yesterday in committee, insurance actuary Bill Andrus presented hard evidence that the actual return on equity in the province of Ontario for the insurance industry was an incredible 25 per cent. When are we going to see these billions in savings for insurance industries being passed on to Ontario drivers to result in a lower premium? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, as noted by the Auto General's 2011 report, Fiscal retained two experts to review the RRE benchmark and develop recommendations. We, uh, we've adopted the widely accepted financial market principles to ensure the RRE benchmark reflects those market conditions. And using that methodology, on an eight-year rolling average, the RRE benchmark for 2013 is, as noted, at 11 percent. But currently, those benchmarks by auto uh, insurance rate regulators in other similar Canadian provinces range up to 12 percent. But notwithstanding that, Mr. Speaker, we've taken the steps to reduce rates to ensure that we pass on the savings of those claim cost reductions to ensure that consumers benefit from further rate cuts, and that's what we're working towards, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the numbers speak for themselves. For three straight years, auto insurers have pocketed virtually every penny from the savings flowing from the 2010 benefit cutbacks. $2 billion in savings each year for the insurance industry and nothing for Ontario's 9 million drivers. It comes as no surprise that the insurance industry, like Ellis Don, 
is a large donor to this Liberal wow. Party. When will the Premier start taking the side of Ontario drivers and not well connected, not the well connected auto insurance industry? Wow. So, as mentioned, Mr. Speaker, Fisco is looking into a return uh, premium model, which would make the benchmark more transparent to Ontario drivers. Of course, we note. Minister of Health will uh, put that down. I've already ruled on that, and it's not going to happen anymore. Please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the benchmark, of course, is not a guarantee of the rate of return, but this is what is. We're taking strong action to bring them down. We've established an industry-wide average of 15 percent for the next two years, eight by August. But this is important, Mr. Speaker. Here's a quote by one of the NDP members. It reads as follows. This is a step in the right direction. I am pleased to say that something is finally being done by Sarah Campbell, NDP for Kenora Rainy River. We agree with her as well, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The question, the member from Brampton West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for seniors' affairs. Seniors have made and continue to make outstanding contributions to our communities. In my riding of Brampton West, seniors are extremely active, and many are affiliated with organizations like Canadian Association of Retired Persons. I'm delighted to say in May of this year, CARP Brampton Chapter 52 held the largest inaugural chapter meeting National CARP has ever had to date. Mr. Speaker, today is International Day of Older Persons. Can the minister outline some of the ways our government is supporting Ontario seniors? Thank you. Minister responsible for seniors. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Brampton West for uh, this important question. Uh, Speaker, let me say that we uh, recognize the fundamental role that seniors play and the remarkable contribution that seniors have made in shaping our province. Speaker, uh, it is an honor for me to serve as Minister Responsible for Seniors Affairs, and let me say that the government is working very hard to make sure that the uh, seniors remain healthy, safe, independent for as long as possible. Uh, speaker, our government has put one of the many uh, plans in place so our seniors indeed can continue to live healthy and independent. Uh, the Action Plan for Seniors is a very comprehensive uh, uh, program supporting age-friendly communities, renewing Ontario's strategy to combat elder abuse, releasing a new guide and program and services for seniors Sir. in Ontario speakers in 16 languages. And let me say, Speaker, that we always look for new ways and new solutions for our seniors in Thank Ontario. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Minister, for that response. Uh, Minister, as you're aware, Ontario is home to 1.9 million uh, people over the age of 65. That represents almost 15% of Ontario's population and 38% of Canada's seniors' population. By 2036, the number of Ontario seniors will be more than doubled to 4.2 million. Minister, this demographic shift will present both new opportunities and challenges for the province of Ontario. Can the minister tell us more about the steps our government is taking to support seniors in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Um, yes, Speaker, again, I want to thank the member from Brampton West because he's very well conversed with the uh, uh, challenges and opportunity of seniors in his particular area. Speaker, let me say that uh, in addition to the Ontario Action Plan for Seniors, for the first time in our history, we regulated all retirement homes. And in 2010, we passed the Retirement Home Act, Speaker. In two since 2003, Speaker, we have invested more than $8 million for elder abuse prevention and awareness initiative. And this includes a $900,000 a year in support of the Ontario Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. Uh, speaker, on top of that, we have put in place the Finding Your Way program, which is uh, an awareness uh, uh, program for people Answer. with dementia. We also implemented the uh, Home Renovation uh, Tax Credit, Speaker, for worth up to $1,500 uh, annually. Speaker, it is mine and the government intention Thank you. to make Ontario the best province uh, for seniors. The members from Central North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is minister, to the Minister of Training, College and Universities. Uh, yesterday, uh, Minister, 250 hairdressers from 37 first choice haircutters salons joined thousands of other tradespeople in Ontario trying to stop your government's trades tax. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It is costing their industry jobs, 
and they simply cannot afford to pay for your new bureaucracy, provides them absolutely no benefit whatsoever. And one more, it's one more consumer tax that the consumer has to absorb. On top of that, now your trade tax enforcement cops are visiting, get this, hairdressing, hairdressers, salons and barbers across the province. It's just a big joke, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister finally stand up for the hard-working tradespeople and abolish the College of Trades once and for all? Thank you. Uh, you. You've left me with an opening again, so I won't take it. So he knows. Too easy. Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about the situation with regard to barbers and the supplementary. But first, Mr. Speaker, I want to respond to the, re re the last request that the member made. This organization, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to things like apprenticeship ratios, has performed extremely well. And I just want to share with the member, Mr. Speaker, a comparison to, to apprenticeship ratio reductions that have taken place. When they were in office, Mr. Speaker, zero apprenticeship ratio reductions. When the NDP were in office, one. Since we've been in office, Mr. Speaker, as a government before the College of Trades, we did eight reductions. The College of Trades has been in place for in approximately six months. That's 13 it. reductions in ratio since they've been in office. Mr. Speaker, that's a heck of a lot better than the record of your government, which Thank I you. remind the legislature was. Thank you. Supplementary. <laughs> Ten years and a half. Well, what can you say, Speaker? You don't even know the file on the ratio reviews. Pathetic. You don't even know the file on it. When are you going to listen? The College of Trades is a boondog. It's that simple. Hairdressers across this province are being overtaxed and harassed by your government right today. First the HST, then the trades tax, and now, of course, the trades cops are harassing them on the site. I personally met with thousands of tradespeople across Ontario and heard their anger over this costly new boondoggle. How can the minister justify forcing hard-working tradespeople like these hairdressers to pick up the tab for the bureaucracy that offers no value to them, their business managers, their owners, or the consumers? Here, here. Minister, can you inform the House even one, one benefit the College of Trades is offering hairdressing salons or barbers Motion. in the province of Ontario? Here, here. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the benefits that the College of Trades is bringing. The, uh, the party opposite talks about reducing ratios for apprenticeships, Mr. Speaker. And just look at the record of the College of Trades. I'm going to repeat it again. 14 apprenticeship ratio reductions in less than six months. Let's compare it to their record, Mr. Speaker. Eight years, zero reductions of apprenticeship ratios. Mr. Speaker, he asked for an example of something good come from, coming from the College of Trades. 14 reductions, Mr. Speaker, in apprenticeship ratios, creating greater opportunities for apprentice, apprentices. Mr. Speaker, when we talk about creating jobs for youth, jobs, jobs for apprentices, dealing with the yes, skills sir. gap and skilled trades, Mr. Speaker, they're working hard, they're doing it, and their record's a heck of a lot better than yours. Thank you. Yes. No question from the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, it seems to be deja vu all over again for the people of Sarnia, Speaker, Wallaceburg and downstream First Nations communities as well. For the second time in a month, people are worried about the safety of their drinking water in those communities. Last week, two new spills followed hard on the heels of a major deal diesel fuel leak into St. Clair River in early September, which we asked questions about at that time. When will the Minister of the Environment put health of the health of Ontarians first by stopping corporate polluters before they spill instead of reacting after the fact. Minister of the Environment. Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, you would recognize that we do that each and every day. First of all, we have in the province of Ontario some of the strictest laws that would exist anywhere in North America in terms of spills that are taking place Absolutely. in this area. Uh, we recognize as well that there is an opportunity to prosecute those who are seen to be in violation of those laws. So whenever a spill happens to take place, it is the responsibility of the Ministry of the Environment to do a full and complete investigation 
and if there is sufficient evidence to prosecute those who are responsible if there's been a violation of the laws of the province of Ontario. Uh, the ministry has been Answer. involved in these matters for some time, has cracked down on this area, yes. and will certainly continue to do so, particularly as a result of some of the recent incidents. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, under the Liberal Watch, chemical spills in the Sarnia area have become a regular occurrence. This year alone, there have been toxic spills by Sun Canadian, Suncor, Imperial Oil, and Enbridge, to name just a few. Instead of wringing their hands after the spill has occurred, when will this government actually protect the drinking water of Ontarians and work with those affected communities to develop stronger regulations and more effective enforcement so we don't have to sail down these troubled waters again and again and again, Speaker? Thank you. Minister? Well, in fact, I've been in discussion with the member uh, the members in this particular area. Sarnia. The member for Sarnia, of course, has been uh, uh, very interested in this subject. The uh, member for uh, Chatham, Kent, Essex, has been very much involved and has drawn these matters to my attention. Mr. McNaughton has been uh, drawing these to my attention as well. And we do have in the province of Ontario very strong laws, and if there is a violation of those laws, we are prepared to prosecute to the largest extent possible. And it would be then, of course, up to the courts to make those judgments. In the meantime, each of these establishments gets visited by the Ministry of the Environment to make a determination of whether they have in place the necessary equipment and procedures which would ensure or at least limit the risk of any spills of this kind taking place in the future. So I have met with the members in the area. Uh, and we have discussed this matter uh, thoroughly, and you can be Answer. assured that the strongest of action will be taken in each and every one of these cases. Thank you. Your question, a member from Scarborough, Gilmore. Mr. Speaker, it's my privilege to rise in the House today. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture and Food. Minister, as you know, Ontario is home to one of North America's largest food processing sectors. In fact, you often say that we have 3,000 businesses that employ more than 95,000 people across the province. There are many people in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood who work in the sector. This summer, I had the opportunity to tour some of the local food stores in Scarborough Guildwood with the minister. Given that this is a sector that provides economic benefits to all areas of the province, from farms right up the value chain for the food processing industry, I think all in this House would be interested in seeing the sector increase in size. With that in mind, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell this House what her government is doing Question. to help Ontario's food processing sector attract investment and grow and continue to thrive. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Scarborough Guildwood for the question. And uh, I also want to thank the Toronto Region Board of Trade, Mr. Speaker, for the uh, conference that they put together with the Consumer Products of Canada yesterday. There's uh, work being done on creating a cluster, Mr. Speaker, of uh, food processors and uh, producers in uh, in this region. The food industry is a, a very important contributor to the economy, as the member has said. Overall, 34 billion dollar contribution to the uh, GDP and more than 700,000 jobs in this sector, Mr. Speaker. So it's very important that we support that dynamic and innovative uh, business, Mr. Speaker. And so at the, uh, at the round table yesterday, um, many of the top innovators in the sector talked to me about transportation. They talked about skill yes, development, Mr. Speaker, and they talked about the things that we can do working together to make sure that we do, uh, we do what's necessary to make this sector grow, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. I was very appreciative for their input. Thank you, Minister, for your response and for informing this House of the work that's underway. My constituents have told me that they really value knowing where their food comes from, and consumers here at home and around the world trust the quality and safety of Ontario food products. I know in my riding our diverse population presents an opportunity for new and different food products that combine the need for convenience with the comfort of one's cultural dishes. We also have an aging population looking for healthful foods. Many reside in, the, in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood. 
We have a growing trend of support for local food and people who read labels and want to know where their food is coming from. What is your ministry doing to promote innovation in Ontario's agri-food sector? Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to talk about a couple of initiatives. Um, one is the partnership with the University of Guelph and uh, the competitive um, research programs that are going on there, Mr. Speaker. And the other one is through the Growing Forward 2 program that was uh, that was negotiated by my predecessor, Mr. Speaker, and he did a great job in working with the federal government and working with companies and the sector to make sure that we had in place supports for innovation and for expansion that are needed and the kind of stability that's needed in the sector because as you know mr. speaker the agri-food sector struggles with the vagaries of weather and those kinds of uh, those kinds of unpredictable changes that may happen one of the significant improvements to the growing uh, forward to this year mr. speaker is that food processing is now included so it's not just the producers but it's also the processors and there were many processors at the table yesterday yesterday at the Toronto Region Board of Trade, and so we're working with them and Growing Forward 2 yes, is supporting them in a very concrete way in their innovation, the, uh, the acquisition of technology, and in, their, uh, in supporting their businesses, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And your question, the member from uh, London, Middlesex, Elgin, Middlesex. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my uh, question is for the Minister of Finance. Uh, Minister, yesterday in committee, the insurance brokers of Ontario those people that represent us in our communities, obtaining the best rates possible for our home, health and cars, implied that the idea of a 15 per cent reduction in auto insurance is a pipe dream. Costs in the system are high and premiums just don't come down because you wish them to. They've seen no credible plan come out of your ministry and without one, the reductions are an illusion. Even if the reductions do occur, the brokers say that no one outside of the GTA will ever see those reductions. I'm from St. Thomas. We have good drivers there, and the city consistently has one of the lowest rates of accidents per insured vehicle in the province. Question. Minister, why do you not think good drivers in my riding, in Collingwood, in Temiskaming, in Cochrane, Thunder Bray, Atacokan, or Kenora, or any other towns and Thank cities you. outside of the GTA deserve any reduction? Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Riga. I really appreciate the question. I'm not sure where the member's been for the last two years because that's exactly what we've been doing. We've been working with the industry, finding ways to reduce those very issues and those costs. And we've been implemented in our strategy safe driver protection so that those that are safe drivers that do have good records get better benefit. And it's working, Mr. Speaker, because, as I've mentioned in the past, we have press releases from various insurance providers who have already started to reduce rates. And I would encourage your—and you've already admitted that they already have reduced costs. So that's a good thing for those communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary? No. no. I'm not sure, Mr. Speaker, if I did actually say the reduced costs. What I'm saying, you promised a 15 percent reduction in auto insurance when, in fact, you cannot deliver that outside the GTA. It's not surprising, though, that you took this idea from the NDP, who last few months ago introduced the bill that would lower premiums for drunk drivers across this province. Yeah. Mr. Wow. Speaker, the PC party has a plan. I wish the minister would implement it. We've told you for months now to reduce the red tape and bureaucracy in the system, reform the dispute resolution process, actually take that anti-fraud task force report that's sitting on the desk beside Drummond and implement it and ensure they have increased insurer accountability. As our leader, Tim Hudak, said yesterday, we have the ideas. You're welcome to steal any one you want. The experts agree in the committee that your 15 per cent pledge is unattainable. It's disrespectful, Mr. Speaker, for the minister to tell the Ontario people to stand by his pledge of an empty promise. Will you stop playing the shell games and admit you have no plan to achieve savings for all Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, what's really rich is Johnny Come Lately all of a sudden is talking about reducing rates. We have already instituted rate reductions in 2004. We've taken the anti task fraud task force recommendations and we have been implementing them. We have releases from CAA and the cooperators advancing the reductions in costs. CAA. And we're taking the steps necessary to reduce them over the last two years. The member opposite is talking about very issues 
like the dispute resolution that we've already started to implement. So thank you for your recommendations. Yours is two years too late. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Transportation. Minister, when last we spoke at the uh, plowing match a couple of weeks ago, you promised an update on the girder situation on the parkway. Yesterday, that briefing was to take place. It was cancelled abruptly. You've been looking into whether or not those girders have to be replaced. Can you update the House this morning on the latest information you have at your disposal, sir? Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank the member for his very sin sin sincere concern about this and uh, uh, his watchfulness on this particular file uh, and his collaboration. And I'm very committed to continuing to work with him and ensuring he gets a full briefing. Mr. Speaker, it was just 24 hours ago that we received the report of the Independent Expert Review Panel. Uh, the Deputy Minister has received it. I have just become aware of some of the contents and details of it. Uh, it is now under the active review of the Ministry lawyers and engineers. Uh, the, chief en Mr. Speaker, the Chief Engineer has had a day with it. It is his responsibility to make recommendations to the Ministry and the government. I have said to the opposition members that I will ensure they have a full briefing prior to its release, and we are committed to doing that. And again, this is a very serious matter which this government takes safety and durability of our structures very critically. And I look forward to working with the member and quite happy to take any meeting or time with him to ensure he's fully briefed and has all the information. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, perhaps I should have posed the question to Dave Battagello of the Windsor Star. Yeah. He's running with a story today that says the girders are coming out. Oh. If the Windsor Star knows about it, why doesn't the minister know about it? And when are the people in Windsor, Tecumseh and LaSalle going to get some information from this government? Um, because, Mr. Speaker, when a minister of the Crown becomes aware that there may be a serious safety issue, he doesn't run to the journalists, uh, he goes and goes to the deputy minister and has a thorough review, which is exactly what I did in May. As you know, Mr. Speaker, based on the concerns that I had, I asked the Deputy Minister to investigate and review. Uh, deputy Layton did that and did a very good job and came back, and we both agreed there was a need for an independent review, which I struck in June. That review worked very promptly over the last 60 days, Mr. Speaker, and tabled its report. This is a review of five of the country's most respected structural engineers and a gentleman with 40 years of experience. Uh, this is a very serious matter. It is a safety issue. But Mr. Speaker, it is an issue of great concern. So we will advance that report. I would like the Thank member you. to have full. Thank you. Thank you. Your question? The member from York Southwestern. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of uh, Children and Youth Services. Ontario recently renewed its commitment to reduce poverty with the launch of uh, province-wide consultations to hear how the government and our communities can continue to work together to break the cycle of poverty. And uh, just uh, yesterday evening, I held a local consultation in my riding of York Southwestern, and one of uh, the many suggestions uh, that came forward um, is that one of the government initiatives that is working the best is the student's nutrition program. Um, a child's ability to learn increases tremendously when you have access to a nutritious diet. So, Mr. Speaker, my question, question. to the Minister is, is our government committed to doing its best to expand uh, and give our, our children the best opportunity to have a good Thank environment you. to learn? Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank the member both for undertaking the consultation in her community last night with respect to poverty reduction consultation and for her question with the student nutrition program. I'll say that uh, this morning, myself and the Minister of Health had a good start to the morning. We were at Church Street Public School, spending some time with the grade six leaders there and talking about our commitment to providing children across the province with the best learning environment. And one of the best ways to enhance that, that we know, is to provide students with a nutritious diet. So this morning, I'm pleased to say that we announced that we are expanding our government's student nutrition program. We will be investing. 
We've heard the same thing about the importance of this program. So we will be investing an additional three million dollars to provide students. This will this will create two hundred new programs for thirty thousand more children across the province. Evidence shows that these programs lead to better concentration and getting more out of the school day. I'm very proud of our record. Thank you. There are more deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.